Hello and welcome to the Cup of Tri Triathlon podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors oxygenatic.com, fuelbycake.com and raceforce.co.uk. Helen, are you there? Are we on? Rob, I am here. I am uh, I'm I'm feeling a little bit delirious uh, this evening and that's purely <laughs> because I, I I had an early start with work today. So I had a little afternoon nap and if you've ever, I don't know, worked early shifts or overnight shifts or just shift work, basically, and you have a, a little nap in the middle of the afternoon when everyone else is at work and then you wake up because you're literally dribbling away <laughs> <laughs> and then you feel rubbish for a couple of hours, but then suddenly, like, you're wide awake and that is the current situation I find myself in. You're wired, are you? Yeah. Back in, what time are you in this morning at? Uh, so my alarm went off at 10 to 4 and I was oh! probably at my desk at about 10 to 5. Oh, commute by bike? Uh, on the way home. That is that is good stuff, mate. Yeah, the, the bike that's, went in the oh, taxi. That's early. <laughs> yeah. It, um, so you took the bike in with you in a taxi yeah, this morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bike goes in a taxi and then I pedaled awesome. home. Yeah. Good for you, mate. That's brill. Well, part of the reason we're feeling delirious, listeners, Helen and I tried our hardest to record last night and um, Skype had a worldwide meltdown <laughs> yesterday. I discovered trying to work out why it wouldn't work um, and just couldn't get it to connect. So we spent all of our podcasting time frantically texting each other, didn't we? Trying to work out why the damn thing wasn't working. And eventually we found the uh, the Skype help forum saying everything had gone down. So we couldn't record then. So we're giving it a little go tonight. And it's so, so far so good. It seems to be working. It does. And I've got myself a new little internet connection here, which has, I think we've got 10 times the broadband speed we had last week, Helen. So hopefully the line quality should be good as well. Um, this is progress. And loads of results. It sure is, man. Loads of results. And we've also got coming up later an interview with the wonderful Torsten from tryrating.com. Fantastic. Um, so a few weeks before Kona, we recorded it. We're obviously now two weeks out from Kona, aren't we? Yep. And Torsten's got his, he does like an annual um, pre-race report where he gives the odds on who's going to win and, and gives the update on all their performances over the year. So I've, I've just found it fascinating looking at tryrating.com over the last couple of weeks. He does totally in-depth report before each of the Ironman races that are coming up and tells you who's racing, what the odds are. But what he also does, Hells, yeah. and this is super clever, is he tells you whether the course is going to be fast or slow because he's got like a like Torsten's racing constant thing wow. that goes on so we can tell you whether a course is fast or slow compared to other courses okay and then after the race he can tell you whether a given athlete was faster or slower on the swim bike or run than his little prediction was saying they were going to be but also whether everybody's swim bike and run was faster or slower than it should have been so you find out kind of you know, some days you get out the bike and you go, oh, I, I was in the water for ages. Yeah, but it turns out everybody was. everyone was in the water. Yeah. I think so, I've seen, I have definitely seen some of his reports. And it is really interesting because I remember, I think it might have been Joe Skipper didn't even feature on one of them. And then suddenly, you know, you go and smash a course and, and then. And suddenly it's like, oh, yeah, well, I didn't really have enough information on that person. But clearly, you know, I now do for next time. So it will be interesting yeah. to to hear what he has to say about, yeah, the likes of Joe, you know, Lucy Gossage, Susie Cheatham, all these athletes who, um, who've had really solid seasons. Well, this is great because the interview that we did, I made him focus on the Brits and, uh, and he was super well prepared. And he basically goes through every Brit and their sort of... Their, their chances and how he rates them and, and he's a super super tuned in guy he, he obviously knows it all off by heart as well so he's dead interesting in interview um i did lose marks for forgetting that leander cave was british <gasps> he wasn't impressed by it at all <laughs> did he say um, did you go through all of them and then did he say yeah uh, and then, yeah, then he was like are you not bothered about leander <laughs> cave and i was like oh drop the ball on that one, one world it's champion. almost like she was so far up the rankings. I, my eyes just kind of zoomed over her. So, Leander, I do apologise if you're listening. <laughs> Imagine. Oh it'd be, it'd be, I think one thing that is fascinating this year is that the men's field on the British side 
is a lot, lot more competitive than in recent years. Mm. I think so. You've got David McNamee on there. Uh, you'll have Joe Skipper. I'm going to miss a lot of people out. I know I am. But and Tim Don, just for starters. Yeah. So it's going to be. It's going to be. Well, it'll be interesting listening to you later on. I know you haven't heard the interview yet, but he'll go through all of it. And then the really cool thing that he does, and I really love him for this. The amount of work that must go into his website is a total labour of love because he does like a pre-race prediction for everyone and then he does a post-race wrap-up for every single Ironman event around the world and the challenge events and the whole deal. And then he produces this Kona ratings report. It's 90 pages, Rob, this year so far. Doesn't charge for it. So he, he operates on a kind of like pay what you can afford thing. And if you can't afford anything, don't pay anything at all. So we're going to have a little download of this before the Kona party. And then we can go through and we can uh, we can have our sweepstakes based on the information in there, I reckon, yeah, Hells. Fantastic. We can afford a quid or two, can't yeah, we? Yeah, money should go to charity, as is always the way. As is always the way. Sweepstake for charity. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Will allow you to nominate the charity. Right, come on, let's get into a little bit of race result action from this weekend. I think we have to start in Chicago, Rob. Yeah. World champions now, were made. <laughs> world champions were made. Tell me about the race house because I was away, I was off the grid, and I don't know what's going on. Well, uh, okay, so let's just start off with the um, elite uh, men. Uh, Mario Mola won, Javier Gomez was second, and uh, Richard Murray got on the podium. But it means that Javier Gomez is the world champion for the fifth time. We've mentioned it before. That's just, it's just so impressive, isn't it? Absolutely. And across a range of distances totally. as well. And disciplines, including X Terra. So, um, yeah, that man is just incredible. And I, I watched his post race interview afterwards and Clearly, for him, the one thing that he doesn't have is Olympic gold. So next year is going to be absolutely huge. And in a way, you know, there were all that talk about him doing the 70.3 World Championships to then perhaps get a slot for Kona and all that kind of stuff. But surely Rio gold is his main aim for next year. Can't yeah, be anything it's else. Gotta be. It's got to be. And do you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this, mate. I kind of... I'm kind of rooting for him, for, you know. I'd, for Rio Gold. For Rio Gold, for Gomez, because I just think he's been such a complete triathlete. I'd love to see him. In, in the same way I used to root for Simon Whitfield as well, I think he's the complete triathlete, and it'd be awesome to see him. You know, as much as we should be rooting for the Brits, yep. it'd be great to see him win an Olympic gold. Um, however... He's got his work cut out, hasn't he? There's some fast, fast boys racing here and looking at how this one went down at the end. Was it a sprint finish he lost out to Mola? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, Mola just pipped him. So it was, yeah, that's, it's, oh, it's going to be great though next year. It really is going to be great because I think injury is going to play a huge part and how the Brownleys managed to recover. Um, mm -hmm. Because obviously Alice is having surgery. Johnny competed in Chicago, finished 12th. He had a really, really decent swim, was there on the bike doing a lot of the work. But then come the run, he had only got in three weeks running training, four weeks running training. So, and he said afterwards, you know, that is a long way on, on just four weeks. So it's going to be key for them over the winter to stay injury free and really get that base, build that base. And then... Um, yeah. They've got to stay injury free. But, that's that's what it's all about for them, isn't it? Yeah, and I thought it was really, really telling, actually, because the BBC coverage of the triathlon, Jonathan Edwards was doing the post-race interviews, clearly former elite athlete, and he said to Johnny Brownlee, you know, I think Johnny Brownlee must have said something like, yeah, now it's a case of working hard over the winter. And the way Jonathan Edwards said to him, mate, just don't overdo it, you could tell it's like, look, I've been there, I know what yeah. it's like you really need to get through the winter injury free really really do not smash yourself this winter it was just quite an interesting because you wouldn't have got that from a non you know non elite mm. person actually really picking up on that and sort of saying no don't be stupid well there's a lot of that in triathlon isn't there this idea that you know I must do more harder faster even going back to the days of mark allen his big breakthrough came on the back of realizing you can't do more faster. You can't do more harder. You're going to have to be smarter and take more recovery. And when he didn't have his big success in Kona until he realized that it was all about the recovery for him as well. So I just hope the boys can 
Because without them, yeah. that field is wide open. Totally. Without them, it could be Mario Mola, it could be Richard Murray. Yep. And Gomez's strength has never been the sprint finish. It's always been breaking people early on in the run. But the thing that tends to happen in the Olympics, as we've That's seen the last couple of times, people get extra wings and can hang on to those surges, can't yeah. they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It'd be interesting if they, you know, if... A bit like with the British guys, you know, you've got Mola and Gomez up there, both competing for Spain. And you wonder how, you know, the Spanish Triathlon Federation speak to them. Do they sort of say, look, Mola, go for it yourself? Or do they say, well, clearly Mola's not the strongest swimmer, is he? So you'd imagine, will they have a, a domestique as well to, to help them both? Mm, it's a, it's a, I mean, it? it's just a question, but he swum, Mola swum 16.33. Yeah, not bad. So... It, it ain't weak swimming. No. He was on, he was on the shoulder of Johnny Brownlee and Javier Gomez. So, Fair enough. I think Ignore maybe maybe then. the well maybe the days of I know what you mean. He's come from a running background, yeah. and we tend to consider, all right, he's from a running background, so he can't be a swimmer. But you know what, mate, sixteen thirty three <laughs> is not chump change, is it? He's put forty five seconds into Richard Murray, yeah. so it's a uh, wow. something to look it's at. Be a good one. Anyway, in the should we move on to the women's? Um, yeah, go on. Because Gwen Jorgensen notched up her fifteenth straight win, which is just, <laughs> just incredible. However, brilliant news. Went sanity. Oh, absolutely incredible! And you kind of think in a one-off race next year at the Rio Olympics, she is going to be really, really hard to stop. However, we should point out both. Both Non Stanford and Vicky Holland finished on the podium. They came second and third, respectively, in Chicago, which means that they have both sealed their place for the Rio Olympics, which is absolutely fantastic. And the the standard that the British triathlon had set, the qualification uh, criteria, was really, really tough. And so to have yeah, met it for both of them, especially coming back from injury is awesome and it shows how incredible they are as athletes it is amazing that isn't it because you're thinking from a selector's point of view they've chosen those they've chosen those criteria to be almost unobtainable yeah. and you think maybe they're doing that so that they then have a choice of who to select yeah. because no one's going to podium in two events right <laughs> and then you go oh boy we've only got one who do you fancy for the third slot i think jody stimson you think so mm. Unless, yeah, 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 I, th I think that's who... I was thinking about that at the weekend. Who are they going to go with? Jenkins? I'd say... I don't, it's, it's really tricky, isn't it? Because Helen Jenkins has clearly got the experience. She's been at the Olympics before. She finished fifth at London. Uh, Super Stimson runner. hasn't been to an Olympics, but yet she did win gold at the Commonwealth Games. Um, and a fit and fighting Stimson is right up there as we saw mm -hmm. in 2014 but she's had a, a poor season this year because of injury um helen jenkins again had a really really dreadful season last year well she didn't compete last year did she because of injury and she's That's been right. struggling a little bit more again this year with injuries so you sort of think right are they going to go with a lucy hall again who will get non and vicky you know up and out in the water and and really work with them on the bike would they go down the domestic route again? It's such a difficult call, isn't it? Because mm. potentially, I mean, potentially they could be entering three women who've got genuine medal exactly. contention. With Jodie Stimson or Helen Jenkins. Do you cut a genuine medal contender out in order to make the chances Hopefully. of the two athletes better? Yep. Huge amounts of funding, hang in the balance. It's, oh, it's a tough call. Who would you go for? Uh... Honestly, the competitor in me wants to say give the three best there the chance to do it. Yep. The person who's had a little view of how elite sport works and knows it's about funding says it's a no-brainer put to put a domestic in there. Interesting. I think Interesting. when you when you consider the millions and millions yeah. of pounds of funding that come with a, any kind of coloured medal uh, as a governing body, it's oh I don't know it's a tough call. Yeah, isn't it? Well, anyway, it's a really why we're not I'm glad I don't have to make it. Yeah, <laughs> ain't that the truth, sister? <laughs> make we a race head-to-head. -head oh, 
God, no, don't, because they'd probably get injured. Um, anyway, Rob, there were loads and loads of age group medals over in Chicago as well. Um, in the sprint distance, uh, the the names have suddenly disappeared, but GB got one gold, four silver, and six bronze medals. I'm going to read them out. Gold medals, Daphne Belt, female 75. That's awesome, that Daphne. That is awesome. You're still kicking it at 75. I just pff, should get an extra gold medal for that for me. <laughs> Silver medal, Edward Castro in the, oh, it says female 25, but I'm guessing Edward is a male. And then bronze medal, we had Neil Eddy and Samantha Rose, both in the 25 to 29 category. That's for the, is that for the, that was standard, standard. yeah. 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 And in the sprint distance, we had Alan Bremner, male 55. Benjamin Terry, Elizabeth Bullivant, Lena Poulton, and Georgina Jennings. Georgina Jennings in the female 70 age group again. Super inspiring. Isn't it just? And then get this in the bronze, Edward Castro again. So he's, so he's medaled twice. in the sprint and the Olympic. Yeah, and I think Daphne did as well. And Daphne Bell, yeah. female 75 as well. <laughs> we also had Paul Ryman, Neil Collins, Christopher Owens, and Emma Fisher. So hats off to you guys that's uh that's seriously impressive winning medals and especially going over to america and racing the yanks over there um they'll have been very very strong fields there indeed so yeah good stuff daphne belt don't know who you are but you sound awesome i just i just think any anybody okay anybody who gets to the gb age group is fantastic anybody who competes in there uh, sort of 60s and 70s I just think is a complete inspiration I love it it, it makes me look at it and go still got a few I years. sat down the other day Hells and uh, and I was wrestling with this idea of do I try and race this season you know I'm trying to come back from injury and clearly having run three times in the last five years without my Achilles hurting my brain's going you'll be fine you'll be fine you'll be fine just enter the race <laughs> and the, the the thing for me is to go do you know what I want to be like Ron and Clive from our club, yeah. 65, 70 years old and still having a go. Probably need to take some care of that Achilles now because that's 30 more years of yeah, racing. Exactly. And it's not three more weeks, is it? So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, right. Okay. Take us to the Toadman World Championships. Yeah, this is so I think this is our quirky sort of story of the week. Um so this, <laughs> the Toadman World Championships was uh, set up by Tom Vickery and um, it, the idea of it uh, was basically swim and uh, run. And uh, they had to do a 400 meter open water swim and then a 1K run and just repeat it, okay? And uh, if you look on Try 24-7, there are various pictures of people with toads. Now, the women's field in this race, which was held on an industrial estate, by the way, near an industrial estate, um, actually <laughs> included uh, double Ironman UK winner, Lucy Gossage, um, Kona age group winner, Catherine Foe, uh, Alice Hector as well. <laughs> so there were a load Hal of them. Davis was there as well. Yeah all having a huge giggle basically um lots of smiles and uh i don't know if you ever tried anything like it rob not dressing as a toad or anything but um the whole uh swimming and running the the idea of swimming in your shoes and running in your wetsuit is just painful beyond words isn't it and i know there's this the thing i love about it is they've not gone with like we'll have 200 quid to enter please you know we'll have a swim run thing and it'll be a million of your english pounds to enter it's like a load of guys all together having a right laugh and doesn't it just go to show that the the heart beating in and amongst our pro triathletes is they want to go and smash each other and have some fun um because you've got oh hal davis took down alice hector by six seconds sneaky <laughs> come on hector you're gonna have to raise your game here <laughs> Natalie Lawrence, in inverted commas, seriously pregnant at the time. <laughs> oh, man, these guys need protecting from themselves. <laughs> it just looks really, really good fun. Um, it does. And I have done a li one event once, which 
was a run swim and um it genuinely was one of the hardest things i have ever done it was yeah. so so hard um and did you have to swim after you ran you had to do so it started off on a beach a swim run swim run yeah, type deal yeah and you had to do three laps so you started off on a beach and i think it must have been about a I don't know, 200 meter swim. You went out to a boy, back onto the beach. Then you had to run up the beach, up and over a bit of a headland, down to a, an estuary, which you then swam across. Then you had to run again another, I don't know, four, five hundred meters, maybe up to a kilometer, swim back across the estuary, um, and then through a forest and back to the beach. Three laps of it. It took me. Now you've told us about yeah. this before. It took you like half a day, didn't uh, it, it, to took do me it? Three hours or something bonkers. It was just so so hard. So uh, yeah. <sighs> At least Toadman's only thirty minutes long. Yeah, exactly. It's a little that bit more mental. realistic. <laughs> I did a I did a swim run swim thing out in Australia, where, you know, obviously came out of the water last, ended up leading into the water thinking happy days after the run and then i've never experienced unpleasant last night trying to swim with it you know like if after a full-on 5k effort on the run it's dreadful isn't it <laughs> lactate burn <laughs> these australian swimmers coming by me like they had little motorboats down the back of the trunks it was just beyond painful yeah. um so yeah so we'll have to be in for that let's apply for a license to hold a toad man down in cheshire we'll do one i think we need to get in Put touch with uh, tom vickery well, Tom, get in touch, man. We want to do it. Sounds awesome. We could, we could hold how. one Tell of the, um, if, if, you're, if they're thinking of doing, which apparently they are, a uh, Toadman World Series next year, we could have one up in Cheshire. Yeah, there we yeah, go. Multi location. No, I've got the exact location to do it. Let's keep it under our hats for now. Okay. I know where. Great. <laughs> <laughs> right, now then, um, where do we go next? We could either, let's go to Try the Beast which is down in Exmoor, isn't it? Yeah, now this one looks brilliant. So it's uh, run by, um, uh, I think, are they X X Man Extreme Triathlons? That's right, company... yeah, X <clears throat> I like that. Yeah. Good thing. A uh, company down in Exmoor, local people. Now, this looks like one hell of a triathlon uh, with quite a decent little uh, climb in it um on the bike and the run that the uh, courses are up on their website so try the beast um you swim in a uh, sheltered bay and then the cycle course uh isn't flat and the run course again certainly is not flat it just looks stunning and the prize for the first man and the first woman they get to go and have a holiday in a luxury villa in italy so really decent prize on offer too now i've got a question does the winning do male and the winning female, do, do they go together <laughs> for the same weekend or do they get to take the partners individually? I, I, I don't know, but I, I imagine. It's kind of, it sounds kind of eugenic, that, doesn't it? We're going to breed new triathletes by sending the winners away to Italy. Love Island. <laughs> <laughs> Has it happened yet or is it this weekend? It's happened. What, the race? Yeah. It's happened. It's happened. And uh, Alex it's Lawson. Just happened. Yeah. All right. Gotcha. I thought it was coming up this weekend. It's already no, it's happened. Already it's already happened. And um, oh, good. in the middle distance, so there was, you could do the relay, there was a middle distance race, and uh, there was a standard distance race as well. So in the middle distance, Alex Lawton, really good win for him. He won by nearly 20 minutes. He did it in four hours 55. Domination. Absolute domination. Ahead of Steve Osborne in 5.13 and David Atkinson in 5.27. Now, in the women's race, that was won by Fenella Language um, in 5.30, who, wow, utter, utter domination. The second place was Holly uh, Farrar in 6.51, and she finished literally about a minute ahead of uh, Lynette Porter, who was third in 6.52. So absolutely brilliant wins there for Fenella Langridge and Alex Lawton. And, uh, I'll tell you what, mate, if Alex Lawton's uh, doing 4.55 right. on a course, you know it is, it is one for you guys who enjoy the hills and the scenery, hey? Totally. Um, standard distance results. Wow. Yeah, standard distance. Tom Lander took it out from Mark Sykes and Duncan Richards. And on the ladies' side, Matilda Woodward won it from Lydia Rosling and Rosalind Willicombe. So there we go. Thanks for sending that through to us, Alex. That would have passed us by on the radar then. And I'll tell you what, it looks like a really decent website as well, doesn't it? So let's see if we can rustle up some more entries for them for next year. It looks, it just honestly, it looks absolutely beautiful. And 
I've done a couple of coastal races in that part of the world in Exmoor, and if you get a uh, if you get a horrible day, then clearly you're in for a long day on the yeah. hills and stuff. But it's yeah, great. It, honestly, if the sun shines, it's just beautiful. So it looks really brilliant, really well organised, and some decent prizes as well. So I'll tell you what I saw as well, mate, on their website on the old Exmoor Extreme Triathlons website. They're putting on a full distance at Wimbledon Ball next yeah, year. Yeah, an X man. X Man. In fact, has it happened this year? Am I just being. No. Uh, am I being no. ignorant or is it just happening next year? Well, July the 31st, 2016, Wimble Ball, X Moor, full distance triathlon. So, um, yeah. Ooh, that looks. That looks good. Yeah. Uh, entries open the 1st of October. So, um, could be one if you're uh, with early bird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, early bird entries. So, um, yeah, if you're keen for a rather challenging <laughs> um, race, then check it out. Uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, perspective about the bike route for their 70.3, um, so it's 57.5 miles with over 6,000 foot of climbing. That's outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely outrageous. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, you want a oh, challenge? Man. Put that one on your uh, bucket list for next year. You said it. Right. Let's go to Lanzarote. Yeah, well, Lanzarote, okay, so this was the 70.3. Quite a few athletes would have gone out to Lanzarote ahead of Kona to try to get, I guess, about as close to Kona conditions as you can get to um, in Europe. Um, And so this one was won by Eneko Janos for the men. He finished in 4.06. He did a 1.15 run. Um, and then Smoky. Roman Guillaume was second. Oh, we um, love Roman Guillaume. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. was he was really friendly, wasn't he, at 70.3 UK? And we said we'd, we'd get him on the show. And we just haven't managed to make it work oh, yet. It, Rob, this was a, honestly, we'll... this was, this came down to less than 15 seconds between the two of them. And I read uh, Lanos ran him down as well. Yeah. Lanos ran him down and then Roman tried to hold him and ended up, you know, 50 yards behind oh. at the finish line. So I tell you what, that's you got to remember, Lanos has finished second at Kona in the past. Yeah. So, a... so he's obviously in good form. Yeah. He's riding well, he's swimming well, he's running well. Brilliant, isn't it? Um, Anthony Costa France came in third and then David McNamee was fourth. He did a 4.09 and he finished with a one fifteen run, so he's clearly looking good, yeah. isn't he, for um, for Kona? Uh, I'd love to see how he holds it together because he can obviously hold the heat there, can't yeah, he? Exactly. He can handle the heat over four and a half hours. Let's see if he can handle it over over the energy lab. Really? Oh, and look who won the ladies' race! Uh, look brilliant, at that. Isn't it? Yep. So Jodie Swallow took out the uh, women's race in uh, four twenty nine. Um, she did two. She did a twenty three, just under twenty four minute swim. So she was. Clearly first out of the water by fair way there. Um, 2.39 bike and a 1.22 run. So her overall time was 4.29. Um, and she had a, what, a 12-minute lead over uh, Jean Collange of France. And uh, Saleta Castro Negreira of Spain was third. Now, the other athlete that we should mention, and we'll come back to Jodie Swallow in a moment, is Kate McNeil, who... Uh, we have mentioned before really we really have, yeah. yeah really good age grouper uh, up until this season focusing on triathlon she has absolutely smashed up the world of time trialing and cycling this season um and she posted a 248 bike at the 70.3 so i think Ooh. it might have been the i think the second or third i don't know maybe like the third or fourth fastest bike split of all the women including the pros Wow, yeah. that's that's going some, isn't so it? So she won her age group uh, by nearly 15 minutes. So she did like a 30-minute swim, 248 bike, and a 150 run. Um, so she's had a brilliant season. So she'll be off to the World Champs in Australia next year. So well done to Kate. Awesome nurse. Yeah, and, w- and I know also that this weekend we had the Brutal was on, the Brutal, the Double Brutal, and unbelievably the Triple Brutal were on. Um, and I cannot for the life of me find the results for those right now. So we'll have to we'll have to give a shout out next week. Um, got a great email through from Caroline Livesey saying that her and Mark have been down supporting their mate Willie, who is doing the double to raise money for charity. Um, it's just 
beyond belief how hard that course is. It's like four laps up and down around Lamberis Pass, and then it finishes with a run up and down Snowden oh in a double marathon. So, and a triple marathon for the triple. So, it's it staggers me. <laughs> so we will come back to the brutal. I, I want to make sure we give the, the respect it's due because um, a couple of friends of mine have raced that as well. Yeah. Anthony uh, TC was there Anthony Garandini so we want to give them some love because I think that's pretty amazing I think, and oh, on, on such a course like that as well oh, it's just really really impressive I think that's one of those ones that oh, the mental mental strength would come into it so much wouldn't it <sighs> wouldn't you tell me it would <laughs> just... I think the winner of the double did like 28 hours oh. so it puts in perspective doesn't it how tough the course is blooming neck <sighs> on that one Wow. It was a big weekend. Lots of results, man. I know, I know. We've got two two other results that we should just... Uh, Go on, let's squeeze little, them in quickly because we've got to move on. Yeah, it was the South Manchester Triathlon and uh, good to see Paul Hawkins getting the win there ahead of Brian Fogarty and Matt Barnes. And in the women's, it was... Well, it's just disappeared, um, which is always handy, isn't it? Let me see if I can call the females up here. Females, go! Julia Anderson in first, followed by Lorraine Hopley and Kate Mills from Nuts for Tri Club. Well, Kate Mills. And Vicky McKinnon down there in seventh yeah. as well. Well done, Vicky. Brilliant. So that's our uh, results yeah. for this week. Fan at Dabby Dozy. And this weekend, Rob, is the uh, Slate Man, Always Aim High, their final sort of third um, race. So they'll be battling out there to try to get that trip to Nevis in the Caribbean. Um, it's not Slate Man, baby. It's Snowman. Slate you did. Sorry. You had Slate Man on the brain. Snowman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a tough one, isn't it? Again, mountainous, and it finishes with a proper full-on fell run up and down 45-degree mountain. Yeah. So it's Mole Shabod, I think. Big. Is it really? Yeah, you will. yeah, I think it's Mole Shabod, yeah. Good stuff. Now, as well, going on this weekend coming up, we have Iron Man Mallorca. And I got a phone call a couple of days ago from the lovely Kate from Race Force, who is currently, as we speak, heading out to Mallorca with a van full of people's bikes, ready to take the guys out onto the course around Iron Man Mallorca. So uh, I'm hoping she's going to try and do a bit of roving reporter for us while she's out there try and grab some interviews held fantastic that'd be so, brilliant we can have a flavour of Mallorca next week that'd be yeah. great wouldn't it might happen and it might not but we'll see how we go she was up for it anyway so good old Kate she's going to give it a go um, obviously raceforce.co.uk are now sponsors of the show so if you're looking for transport for your bike out to any of the late season races they've still got slots available for Challenge Poguera and Challenge Sardinia and also if you're looking for transport solutions for your bike for next year get over to raceforce.co.uk and look at the events they're going to they'll be sending their enormous Mercedes Sprinter vans out to various enormous races around both Challenge and Ironman distance they've got two vans now Helen she was telling me brilliant I love it and they so were doing and a... they do lots of they do a fair number of local triathlons as well going and offering mechanical support so yeah it's doing it's doing well yeah good little good little service going on so let's look at I'm a Mallorca coming up I tell you what I don't know how many of these people have entered and then they've qualified for Kona and they're not going or how many of them have not made Kona or how many are doing both I mean it's almost inconceivable that you'd race you Mallorca and then no. go to Kona but there are 38 pro men registered what? and 20 pro women registered for this. Wow. And not small names either. Timo Bracht, James Kanama, Jan van Berkel, Horst Reichel, Matthias Hecht, Chris McDonald, Richie Nichols, Christian Breda, Harry Wiltshire. That's just from the, you know, the first few there. We've got Anya Berenik, Diana Riesler, Imar Mullen, uh, Camilla Lindholm, Caroline Livesey's down, but I know she's not racing. So, uh, I mean, that could be a really amazing race, couldn't it? Yeah, it'd be... I'd have thought Timo Bracht would have qualified for Kona, wouldn't you? I don't know. We'll have to listen out. See if uh, does, does Torsten mention him. Well, mm, he doesn't don't actually. Know. Well, what you can do is go Torsten's to Torsten's try... very good on his little website at crossing them out if he knows they're not starting. <laughs> so, um, so you can cross out Caroline, mate. If you're listening, Torsten, because she's definitely not racing, she's gone over to do Malaysia. Oh, nice. Yes. Um, 
So there we go. That's the upcoming races, isn't it? Yeah, love it. Well, we will be bringing you up to date with all of those things um, next week, definitely. You know, mate, we're going to have to end this podcast. We've we've talked nonsense, haven't we, for ages. <laughs> and we've still got the interview to run through. So let's sign off here. Thanks very much for coming on, Hells. It's great to talk to you again. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And we will uh, catch up again next week. We will catch up again next week. Now, next week, I've got an interview lined up with... Uh, who have I got lined up for next week? Can you remember? Lucy Charles. Lucy Charles. Well done. I've got Lucy Charles on her build up to Kona. Um she's a crazy cat right now she is in some heat chamber training every day in a heat chamber so i look forward to listening to that interview next week mate um but until next week we're going to sign off now we're going to hand you over to our interview with torsten we're not going to come back on after the interview's been on so our sponsors again have been oxygenaddict.com fueledbycake.com and raceforce.co.uk i'm coach rob Wilby, and i'm helen murray And you've been listening to the Cup of Tri Triathlon Podcast. Until next week, have a great training and racing week. Be safe and we'll speak to you again in a week. Take care now. Hi, Torsten. Welcome very much to the Cup of Tri Triathlon Podcast. Uh, Really excited to have you on the show. Um, Now, listen, for the the listeners who have never heard of you before, let's give you a bit of background information about you. You run a really cool site called tryrating.com, and I'm sure some of the guys will have heard you on IM Talk and have heard Bevan and John um, either interviewing you or using your site to discuss basically how the pros are getting on and who's qualifying for Kona. But (laughs) your site goes so much deeper than that, so I thought it would be really cool to get you on and to talk through a whole host of stuff that Helen and I have just found hard to get our heads around. <laughs> so first up, thanks very much for uh, for coming on. Sure. Tell us a little bit of the background about your site. How long have you been going and, and why did you start it up? Well, I think I've been going for like three or four years by now. And initially it started with, a, with the simple question, um, how do you compare uh, the German Ironman distance races in Frankfurt and, and Rode? usually pretty fast uh, courses how do you compare that to say Kona and the times there because then you always have this discussion oh he went fast in road but he's no good in in uh, in, in Kona um, the times are different and road is always short anyways and so on so how do the times compare yeah. that and um, that was my starting point and it developed into um, um, rating courses and rating athletes and I'm f- just focusing on the on the pro side there because um, there's already enough stuff to do. And when I started, I thought, well, I just look around for some of the data that I need to do the analysis. And then the main work would be the, the analysis. But it turned out there is no um, database of results that you just go to and that you just um, um, suck into your database and, and, and your own PC and do the analysis. A lot of work had to be done to um, collect all the different results from races all over the world, um, correlate them with each other. I mean, uh, names and spellings between different athletes, that's always something interesting, especially with yeah, the, the German umlauts yeah. and the Brazilian <laughs> names and then um, different countries and so on. So that turned out to be a lot of work that I needed to do before I could do the analysis. And that proved to be worthwhile to a lot of people. So uh, what I can do now pretty much with a few uh, keystrokes is when there's a start list for a new Ironman, I can just plug that into my database and have a feeling or a pretty good um, indication on who's who's fast, who's slower, um, the r- previous results of these athletes and so on. And that's uh, helpful to a lot of people. And that's main the, the main stuff that I do uh, on the website now is before a race, before an Ironman race, post the start lists and kind of give my prediction on who's going to finish where. And uh, after the race, analyze, okay, how fast was this race uh, compared to other courses and compared to other years that the race was run on the same course or on a similar course. And then bind that all together for the big race in Kona, of course. Yeah, and one of the things I found really fascinating sitting down here, I've got to hold my hands up. I am a bit of a data geek. So looking at all the different... 
Uh, I'm, I'm no good with spreadsheets, but I love looking at data. So <laughs> your site for me is awesome because I can look at it and it's all broken down really simply. And it lets you know immediately whether, you know, for a given course, whether it was a fast year or a slow year or, you know, for, for some reasons, it seems like the times are unaccountably fast or slow mm-hmm. on, a, on a given year. And on other courses, it seems like they're pretty pretty consistently slow or fast compared to other courses. So, so let's talk first about about the courses that are out there. Obviously, most of our listeners are from the UK and we're UK focused. So, we've got <laughs> Ironman UK, we've got Ironman Wales, and Ironman Wales is coming up in a week's time. Now, I pulled up a bit of the stats here. The first thing that stands out to me is the bike course adjustment for Ironman Wales is like. An average of about minus 25 right. minutes, isn't it? So that pretty much tells us Ironman Wales has a really tough bike course, doesn't it? Yeah, um, that's also consistent with what I heard from a lot of the athletes. A lot of wind, a lot of up and down. Um, the road surface is not very nice and so on. So that all adds up to a really, really slow bike course. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then... Another thing that stands out here is I'm looking over the, you've got sort of race adjustments for different years. And in 2012 on Ironman Wales, the run adjustment is like 17 minutes. (laughs) So does that mean the run course was 17 minutes faster than you expected it to be? Um, Well, the the number would be to a not existing average uh, course. Um, Usually it's easiest to compare um, either different courses between different years or or one course between different years. And if we look at that, yeah. um, 1726 uh, for 2012 was the adjustment compared to usually run ratings around zero. So it was like 15 or 17 minutes quicker than what it usually is. And from what I heard, because that's that's pretty obvious discrepancy to the, to the other, other numbers there, from what I yeah. heard from people was that um, they shortened the run course that year. Um, as far as I know that from Wales, you have like a, a mile or so from the end of the swim up into T1 and then the start of the That's bike. Right, yeah. yeah. And they took that mile away from uh, the run course uh, to, sh- uh, to, to even it out. And I, I think see. that was the only yeah. year that they did that and switched back to normal run course after that. So, I mean... Similar to you, um, there's there's the the odd things that you notice in the data, but once you can correlate that to actual stuff happening and answering what caused this, that's uh, stuff that I find interesting too. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, now, let's have a little chat about your predictions for Ironman Wales that's coming up this weekend. Um, I've got your Ironman Wales prediction sheet coming up here. Um Obviously, the first thing that stands out is we've got a we've got a pretty tough day out for the athletes that are racing there. The bike is a is a very hilly, twisty, turny, windy sort of slow road surface, back roads kind of course, yeah. and and the run is very hilly. And as well, you've got this this massive run that you've got to kind of go up a set of almost windy steps from the sea to actually get to transition, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing that stands out is we've got a really big pro field here, haven't we? We've got kind of like 20, 25 pro men and 13, 14 right. pro women starting. Yeah, it's very good because last year we only saw two female uh, racers, two female pro racers in Wales. And it's good to yeah. see now at least 14 on the start list. And, in, well, there's usually some some people dropping out, but at least to have like 10 plus uh, female pros in the race, that's that's good to see. Yeah, they'll make it a, a much better race, won't it? Um, and is this a qualifying race for the next? Are we now into the next Kona qualifying period? Is that right? Yeah, is it the thirtieth yeah. of so August? So this would already be points, points counting towards Kona twenty sixteen. I see. So is it is it fair to think that a lot of the pros who are going to be racing here are the guys who um, are trying to build up their points for Kona for next year? And maybe haven't qualified for Kona for this year. Do you think? Yes, that's that's how I view it. Um, a lot of pros um, that are looking to qualify for Kona have figured out that they need to start as soon as possible uh, accruing points towards next year. And if yeah. uh, uh, one or two uh, fall Ironman races um, is usually a good way to start. That's why um, the fields might not be uh, too stacked in the remaining Ironman races that we have, but there I, I expect a pretty large number of people to show up there. And mm. um, you mentioned Carolyn Lashy. Um, she's uh, missed Kona qualifying this year. She wants to go next year. So Wales is the uh, perfect uh, place for her to start. Yeah, now that, that leads us on quite nicely, actually, doesn't it, to talking about, um, 
you know, obviously we're, we've got Kona coming up in in about a month and a half's time. Um, and we had Caroline on the show a couple of weeks ago. And at the time she was, she'd just finished second at Ironman UK. She'd finished, I think she got third at Lanzarote. And she didn't quite have enough points to make the cutoff at that 35th place. Mm-hmm. So she was going over to try and race a 70.3 in, I think, Wiesbaden to try and pick up their final few points to sort of get her to, to, to Kona, essentially. And she didn't quite manage to do that. So what do you think the effect is on the fact that there's only sort of 35 slots for the girls, but there's 50 for the men? What what effect have you noticed on how often the women have to race? Well, I mean, the effect is pretty obvious. They need more points because they need to be placed higher up in the KPR rankings. And needing more points, if you're not um, just just getting these points by winning races, means you have to race more often. Caroline was a is a good example for that. Um, a lot of people looking for the final races um, around the world to to catch some extra points to go over the hump there. Uh, she came up just short I think three or four hundred points were missing for her to make it this year um, mm. but um, yeah all, overall the, the women pros have to race more often than the male pros to make it to Kona and for me that's the my main argument why I think the, the number of slots should be equal because it creates a different um, dynamic in Kona if you have um, people that are uh, rested I mean take for example a Rini uh, she won last year. She did, um, I think, Florida or Arizona. She, uh, no, she did. She did Melbourne earlier this year. She had like half a year to prepare for Kona and uh, race. However, she feels uh, best uh, going into Kona, whereas others have to scramble till late July or sometimes even to August to make it to Kona. And obviously, they'll be uh, less um, rested going into Kona. And also less able to have a decent build for Kona. And I think that that creates um, a different race dynamic than uh, what should what, what we should have in, in Kona. Everyone should have more or less equal opportunity to prepare well for Kona. And the 35-50 split um, just changes things for the women compared to the men. Yeah, it certainly doesn't seem fair in inverted commas that you've got a situation where you've got ladies lining up to race who've had to race three Ironmans and a couple of 70.3s. Well, some, some against... race even more if, if they yeah. uh, have a bad race and then need more points, they have to race another uh, Ironman. There's a lot that did four or five even this year, even if they can only um, use three in their in their KPR score. Yeah, and it's it's a massive tax on a body. If you look at the effect of that over a, even a three year period, you're looking at sort of fifteen Ironmans in your body in a three year yes. period. Yeah, you've got to question the sustainability of that, don't you? Really, in in terms of the athletes themselves. Yeah, and that, that's also something that a lot of athletes, when they think about qualifying for Kona and how to attack that, there's always this. Okay, um, think about how you can get there, uh, but make sure you. This is not the only defining thing for your season uh have a backup plan and pull out of Kona qualifying if things get get really bogged down because if i mean if if you race one year um three or four ironman and then add in a couple 70.3s to get the remaining um um points to to make it to Kona and then you show up in Kona um tired and don't have a good race then the next year becomes even harder because you basically start with zero points, whereas a lot of other yeah. people have their fall races. And even if they don't score as well as you can in, in Kona, um, it's just so much harder again to get back to Kona. And so this this one hard season um, trickles over to the next and, and the, the year after. And it's always hard decisions that uh, a lot of athletes have to make. Yeah, sure. And is is Kona very heavily weighted in terms of points itself? So presumably if the athletes do well at Kona, if you're in the top 10, say, you'll rack up a fair amount of points yeah, yeah. towards next year's qualification already. So again, that becomes a, if you do well, it's easier for you to do well for next year. And if you don't, you're even more tired for the next year when you're starting. Yes, the easiest way to qualify for Kona is to get a number of, of the points or most of the points that you need to qualify in Kona because say 10 top 10 is pretty much safe for, uh, for the next year uh top 15 for the men probably and then you just need another halfway decent iron man um to validate uh your result and then maybe add in a 70.3 and you're good to go if if you're strong enough to place well in these races yeah sure 
Now, listen, one of the other really interesting things about your site, we've talked about how we can we can sort of look at courses and we can sort of say, well, this might be a faster course or this looks like it's got a faster bike course. But the other thing it allows you to do, obviously, is make predictions based on, you know, a particular athlete's previous results mm-hmm. and make re- predictions about how fast they're going to go, you know, according to their previous results in a given course, which I think is really clever. Um, have you ever had a result where you've got it exactly right and somebody's won who you've predicted and the times were pretty much spot on? Um, yes, <laughs> but that's, that's <laughs> like... Uh, that must be a great feeling, uh, right? Yeah, but it's, it, I mean, there's a lot of luck involved there because the athlete has to perform to his normal standard and the course conditions have to be normal uh, as well. And sometimes that happens. Uh, a lot of times that doesn't happen. Um, and uh, um, for me, these predictions are just, I mean, it's its a bit playing with numbers and getting indications on what might happen. But um, I, I find it interesting that um, obviously you still have to run the race to get the result. I mean, its it's not like a numbers... Uh, thing that is going on but racing an Ironman there are so many elements of where things can go right or things can go wrong that having the actual race is still very interesting but um, it allows me for example to um, think about how how the race might look like um, the typical example would be uh, Rini and Kona you can you can think before the race okay how much time can Rini afford to give up based on previous races to Rachel Joyce or Daniela Reef or, or Caroline Steffen and so on how far back is it okay for her to come off the bike and still be in a good position to win the race if everyone performs similar to what they did before obviously yeah. Daniela Reeve can run faster than her average probably is, and Rini might not have the uh, 250 day she had last couple of years. So things are still very, very interesting. Uh, but at least it gives you some some um, ideas of what to look for other than just, okay, who's in the lead and um, wh- how far ahead is, is he or she? Yeah. Now, do you know, the, the, the more I talk to you here, the more I'm seeing how this could be really fun and useful for us. Because one thing we have over here is I get all my athletes and club mates together and we have a Kona party. Mm-hmm. We all usually in the past, it's been at my house, but it's it's outgrown my house this, <laughs> this last year. There's no way we can get everybody in or sort of crammed into my living room. So so we've been sitting down and trying to work out sort of who's going to do what and who's going to come out of the water where and what their expected results are. And of course, the difficulty is always remembering an athlete's performances over that whole past year you, you've maybe got a feeling that you know someone will say Jan Fredino is going to do this because he did this at Frankfurt mm-hmm. or whatever but having the set of data that you've got here in front of us would allow us to sit down and go well look yeah Torsten says this has happened in the past and perhaps Rini will do this kind of run so it'll add a bit of drama and excitement to the proceedings as we go along as well I think yeah but of course um, say if if uh, Sebi makes up this much time to whoever on the bike you never know is he really that strong on this day <laughs> or is he just overpowering I mean the, the discussion that's yeah. always with, with Marino when he goes off the front in Kona is he is he overdoing it and will just come undone in the in the energy lab or is he really going to pull through this year i mean there's there you can have a look and say okay this was faster than expected or uh, sebi is usually say four minutes behind Jan. this this year it was only three so did Jan have a bad swim did uh, sebi mm. have a good swim um there's there's always so much speculation but it, it it gives you some context of where to evaluate uh where things are in the race yeah do you know man i think you'd be brilliant up on the live feed for iron man i think we should put a pitch in for <laughs> iron man to actually employ you and fly you out to kona no seriously because your kind of statistics knowledge here that would be it i mean you know how it is the live feed from kona is so long there's a lot of yeah. time where the talking heads are just kind of talking and there might be a section where that the one camera is just following a single person for for 20 minutes it feels like at times but to have that kind of feedback going on in the background from you who firstly you understand the numbers but you also understand the implication of the numbers i think would be a a great sort of maybe you should offer it as a you should do a live skype talk over the top (laughs) of it man and people could tune in i'd I'd tune into that that'd be awesome (laughs) yeah i usually put out try to put out some some updates and some information on on twitter and maybe i'll do some some live stuff again this year 
uh, on on the website. I'm not sure how how I'm going to do that. And of course, if Iron Man wants to fly me out to Kona and have me set up there, uh, I wouldn't wouldn't be against it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I don't have any contacts there yet, mate. But maybe in a year or two, hey. <laughs> So listen, let's talk about Kona for this year because it's, you know, we're, we're into the start of September. We're, I suppose we're only four weeks away from Kona now, aren't we, really? Um, now we've had the 70.3 Worlds. Let's talk through the women first. What are your feelings for for how the, the race is going to play out? And firstly, what do the numbers say? If everything went as expected, how is this race going to play out on race day? Well, my one, two, three, based on on the simple numbers, uh, would be Rini winning the race again, uh, Rachel Joyce coming second, and Daniela Reeve coming third. Um, but just using that, uh, you can already start the discussion. I mean, Daniela has had an an awesome last two years, especially over the longer distances. I think she, the only race she didn't win the last two years was was Kona last year. So obviously, you have to consider her as one of the if not the single favorite, at least uh, with Rini, uh, one of the two big favorites uh, for the race. And I don't think that the numbers um, will be able to properly determine who you, who's your, your favorite pick going to be for, for this year and how it's going to turn out. It's just mm. amazingly close between these two. Um, I mean, the numbers are like four or five minutes apart. Uh, but that is easily a time that you can win or lose in an Ironman. And um, Daniela has had such a stellar performances. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally amazed by what she's done. But um, Rini has had um, the year set up as she, she likes it. Um, she had an early Ironman where she just validated her slot and can just prepare for Kona all all year long. That's the way she she's likes it. She's just under the radar, and she's isn't just, she? I mean, she's always good. And she, I don't know, she finished second in, a, in an Olympic distance race just last week in the US. So, um, yeah, she, I just saw really, that. She uh, she did really well, didn't she? She built up to it. And I mean, you can always expect a good performance from, from Rini and Kona. She's never been off the podium there. So, um, why should she be this year? Yeah. Do you think, um, I think if Rachel Joyce and uh, Danielle Reef got together on the bike, and rode together. Yeah, not, think they, not only these two. I mean, the, the way that I see it is um, the, the race will unfold pretty similar to, to last year. Um, Daniela uh, will at one point um, early on the bike go to the front and try to ride away from the rest of the field. Um, but I expect there's, there's going to be one or two women at least that will try to go with her. Um, this could, could be Caroline Steffen, it could be a Jody Swallow if she's she's healthy, could be a Meredith mm. Kethler, um, Mary Beth Ellis, Leanne de Cape. I mean, there's there's a number of of um, women that um, have a similar uh, outline to to her and and just be able to try and go with her. And there's you know if you have like a group of four or five five women that go out there, there'll always be at least one that that doesn't explode and is able to keep up the pace for for a long long time. So. Um, then the question becomes how big of a lead is this group going to be able to build over Irini, who's further back after the swim and is probably going to lose some more time on the bike. How far back is she going to be into T2 and how much time can she make up on the run? Yeah, yeah. So your gut feeling is Irini's going to be able to do it, huh? <sighs> I'm putting you on the spot here, uh, aren't I? I, I, I I'm, <laughs> I'm of two minds. I mean, I was in Frankfurt and, and saw how dominant and how... Um, self-assured Daniela was before the race and how uh, confident she was just going off the front on the bike and dealing with whatever uh, the other athletes threw at her. Um, my, well, I'll probably go with Daniela because I think Rini um, is not going to be able to have a third 250 run in Kona this year, um, even if it turns out to be... I mean, she, she'll probably still have the fastest run, but if it if it was a 255 last year, everyone would have said, well, she had a good run, but Daniela was just too far off the front, and that's probably what's going to happen this year. Yeah, yeah, okay, interesting. And on the men's side, let's... Uh, let's you don't want to go into the Brits there? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll come back to the Brits. All right. and we'll the Brits is a big group, hey? Yeah, well, then on the German, on the men's side, we'll talk about the Germans then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is looking like it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be a German powerhouse show at the front again, isn't it? Yeah, well, and we, we might, may even have another year where we have a German podium in, on the men's side. I mean, two big names up there, uh, Jan Frodeno and Sebastian Kinder. Um, similar dynamics to what we have with, with Rini and Daniela. 
uh, one the defending champion, the other one had a, a strong last two years. Um, yeah, Jan has been very, very impressive in in Frankfurt and in the other races that um, he's been doing. Um, Sebi also had a good year so far. I mean, his, his Frankfurt race this year was probably um, even better than, than last year. Um, his run in the 70.3 champs was pretty impressive. So, uh, yeah, again, I, I wouldn't really know how to choose between these two. <laughs> mm, it's, it's a tough call, isn't it? Especially after we saw... You know, Sebi was so controlled on the bike at the 70.3 Worlds and rode it really smart, didn't he? And then to put in the run performance that he did, I think that really opened a lot of people's eyes to the fact that he's not just one of these kind of crazy go-off-the-front bikers. He he really can run, can't he, as well? Yeah, and he, he knows how to punish himself and take the last drop that he has out of him um, and, and put it all on the line. Um, yeah, his, his run... Um, in, I think he was running faster than Javier Gomez and then Jan in, in the 70.3 champs. And I don't think that yeah. too many people would have would have predicted that. Um, of, of course, yeah, you can always argue that Jan coming, was so far they? off the front and Javier didn't have a chance to place any better. But but still, that was impressive. And he was he, yeah. he didn't just post a fast time. He was looking smooth, too. So, uh, yeah, that'll be interesting to see what he and would be would be something if Sebi won the race on the run. <laughs> Yeah. And it'd be I mean it's not it's not inconceivable to think that the two of them could end up having a kind of Mark Allen, Dave Scott style battle where Sebi rides up to Ian Fidino on the bike and the pair of them ride together and then run together. We could see a real epic battle here, couldn't we? Yeah, but I don't I don't think it'll turn out to be like a, 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 a an iron war type of uh thing. I think uh if if anything, um we'll we'll have one or the other running stronger, um and then um, pulling away, say around the energy lab. I, I think we'll we'll have a, a pretty good understanding of who's going to win at the end of the energy lab again. Okay, there's your prediction right there. I'm still hoping for the for the iron war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would it would be interesting to see. I mean, we've never really had that that sprint finish on on Ali Drive on the pier. <laughs> that would yeah. still be something to see. But um, yeah, usually. Uh, it doesn't really happen, and I mean, with with Jan, the question that I would ask is, um, I don't think we've ever had um, someone winning a, a big summer Ironman, the seventy point three champs, and in Kona, he may have already, um, you know, used up too much energy in these two big races, and may not have enough left uh, for Kona. Whereas Sebi, he said he's he's been world champion the last three years. So he wants to have at least one title this year, and the only one that's left would be Kona for him. Mm. So he might be a, yeah. just a touch hungrier, but uh, Jan was... Yeah, I, I think he's. both of them are very, very impressive athletes, and yeah. both of them would would be deserving champions. But we'll see. I mean, there might be others that um, contend in there. Um, I think Freddie van Lierde had a, had a good race uh, in, in uh, South Africa earlier this year. That was pretty impressive because he won by, by a huge margin. And South yeah. Africa is a slow course, so I think he did an 8.16, which is still uh, fast. Uh, fast really, it? Yeah. really good performance. He didn't quite have it uh, in Germany, but um, I don't think he was mentally too focused on, on Frankfurt. I mean, he might have um, prepared well and trained well for it, but I don't think his, his heart was 100% in that race. It'll be yeah. more in Kona. And he was disappointed last year coming eighth i think and he he'd love to become a second uh um champion for a second time yeah he's a he's a superb athlete as well isn't he i, I was out in france one of the years that he won yes. and he just yeah. he was just like a terminator on the run it was just so impressive to watch so again he's had a fairly quiet period since then so you wonder whether the fact that sebi and jan Fadino have, have raced the 70.3 worlds whether that might have an impact on their racing kona it it could be. I mean, it, um, if if they attack it as a, as an A race, then obviously it'll have an impact for the Moncona. But th- from what I could uh, hear from both of them, it was just well, it was a ra- it was an important race, and um, they they um, did some sessions to prepare for it. But they didn't treat it as an A race. Um, it was probably more like a B race, um, yeah. and they didn't fully taper for it and so on. So. I don't think it took too much of them away, but the mental energy that these um, tough races and deep fields take, that just might be something that takes a bit away from them. For Kona. Sure. But you never now, know. 
<laughs> you never know. Now let's talk Brits. Let's start with Brit men. Um, do we have a hope of having a British man on the podium or in the top 10 this year? What do you think? Well, my predictions say no, but um, it's it's hard to tell with a lot of these uh, athletes there. Um, Our I, first guy to look at has got to be Tim Don, hasn't it? Yeah, he, Tim Don. He stands out I mean, he's just done his races this so year. So far, he's only done one Ironman, and he won that in Mallorca, I think, last year. So that's right. Um, he's kind of hard to uh, um, hard to make a call on, right? Yeah, and, and and it was his first Ironman, so he didn't put everything on the line. My would be my guess. Um, he didn't risk everything that um, he would do if it was like a Kona type of race. Um, he was probably just going into it and trying to figure out what was going on and whether uh, he'd be any good at it. So it's it's hard to um, to um, calculate his Kona potential off that one race where he wasn't really one hundred percent in it. I mean, nonetheless, sure. he won it. And I think he was preparing since then for Kona. Um, he's had a couple of good races over uh, this year as well. Um, but he's, he's had a few wins over 70.3. I think he's won three or four and mm-hmm. finished second a couple of times as well. So, yeah. again, he's known as being a kind of an all or nothing athlete. Right. He either exactly. he either wins or he's second or he's nowhere. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's also what I think will happen for him in Kona. Um, he's the first time there, so he might be totally overwhelmed with how the race unfolds. Um, the race dynamic is, is totally different from the smaller Ironman races. Um, it's, it's also something that uh, will be interesting how, how Joe Skipper is going to do, because in, in the Ironman races that he usually does, is he's, cut, he's a bit back after the swim, then he rides through the field, uh, goes to the front on the bike and then tries to figure out whatever happens there. But um, in Kona, it'll be different because you can't just ride through the field because there's a big group of, say, 20, 25, 30 athletes uh, strung out. Uh, that's the front group. <laughs> and yeah. uh, coming up to that and just overtaking that and riding by that, that's something that he probably um, – hasn't seen like that before and um some athletes do well uh with it when they see it for the first time and they just um fit right in and some of them are just overwhelmed by it and uh, unless you've seen athletes in this type of race dynamic you never know how it's going to turn out yeah that'll be a real interesting one actually to see whether joe um you know he's he's probably going to be a few minutes back out of the water if his swim goes the way it has done Mm -hmm. and so he will be riding to try and ride up to the group the question is, just like you said, it's whether he kind of gets excited by that and thrives on the fact he's passing all these big names or whether it just becomes, I mean, you can only imagine how much it must psych you out mentally to be passing all those kind of names you've been reading about in the press for years. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it, it, it would also require a huge uh, power spike to, to go by that group because once you start overtaking people, you can't just slot in. You probably have to go by the, the, the whole group and that can be yeah. mentally and physically taxing. Um, he may get a dodgy drafting call in that and um, yeah, so you never know how that turns out. Yeah, sure. And another name that pops out is David McNamee. He he won Ironman UK. Mm-hmm. He stepped up this year from ITU Racing. Um, he's had a couple of good results, but he just looks so controlled. Ironman UK, and obviously it's his first um, his first sort of big appearance on the world stage. How do your sort of ratings? have him coming out i mean i have him rated based on his result from the uk as the best uh brit uh at this point but um he's also not not close to the front and again same questions as for the others first time there how how is he going to deal with that and how controlled is he able to uh to go with it i mean what's what's he setting as a goal for him um usually when there's when there's um athletes that just made it into kona um, I sometimes would suggest to them they'll just um, figure out a way of um, going through the bike in a decent halfway decent position, um, go strong on the on the run because a lot of stuff will be decided in the last hour of the race, and then you can easily uh, come up from twenty fifth to fifteenth or maybe even further, and that would be a good result for a first year Kona finisher because then you've had uh, a good start for the following season and can then really more focus on on Kona there and uh, David and I mean all the others um, well maybe not Tim Don because because he's probably not going to have too long of a career but for Joe 
and for um, for David, that, that one might be a reasonable goal just to finish, say, 15th. Uh, be happy with that for this year and then focus on Kona a little bit more uh, for next year. Yeah, maybe not try to be the guy who goes off the front on the bike and makes a big name for himself as, you know, um, you probably remember Phil Graves did that his first yeah. year out in Kona. Yeah. Went off the front and, and kind of detonated, didn't he, after 80 miles or so. But, you know, in doing so, I made a big name for himself. But then yeah, I remember at the time was all being really excited that he was going to kind of be the next big thing. Mm. And it's, it's never really happened for him since then, unfortunately, mm -hmm. with one thing and another. So you're right. I'd like to see the guys put a consistent mark upon the board this year and just, I mean, 15th place on the one hand doesn't sound stellar or amazing, but you've got to remember it's the world championships and these guys are stepping up for the first time, aren't they? Yeah, and and it, it as I said, it helps up set up next season, and then you can maybe put some more um, aggressive goals out there. But <laughs> talking to Joe, that's probably not what's on his mind. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, it's interesting. We're we're doing this interview now, pre-recorded, and it'll go out either next week or the week after. <laughs> Um, I'm recording tonight's show. Joe is going to be my co-host, actually, because Ellen, the usual co-host, is is away. So I'm going to pick his brains. And, and I know already what he's going to... I mean, you know already what he's going to say. <laughs> oh, man. Right, look, let's move on to the, the female Brits. Um, we've got... I mean, we're in this great position at the moment. It's such strength and depth in the ladies' side in British Ironman Triathlon. Um, in the top 10 in the numbers here, we've got Jodie Swallow, Rachel Joyce, and Leander Cave. Mm -hmm. Who who do you fancy out of all of the British women to, to maybe be the top Brit this year? Well, from, from the numbers, I have Rachel in second, so she'd, she'd be my top British pick. Um, the question mark for her is she was, she was injured early in the year, couldn't really run for a while. Um, the last races, she seemed to be okay, but you never know how that turns out for the full Ironman distance. Um, yeah. But um, she has always been extremely, extremely consistent in Kona, uh, which helped her to get uh, all the, the places that she got, but maybe prevented her from winning. I said to her, when um, you want to have this this one race where you're just putting everything on the line and, you, and the only outcomes is e either you win or you DNF. And she's always been on this consistent, good um, basis, but she never had this this really, really stellar day. Uh, in Kona, so I don't know if it's if it's going to be this year. Um, probably not, because uh, the injury might have taken a bit out of her. Uh, might have been a blessing in disguise in that she didn't um, put too much on the line earlier this year. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got to hope for that, haven't we? Obviously, Jody Swallow had a crash the day before the seventy point three world, so we don't know how much that's going to affect her. But she's got to be another one. She's put some amazingly impressive performances out there as a especially as a swim biker mm -hmm. but she can also run as well so she's another one who you think well on if she has a perfect day and it all comes together at the same time i could see her winning as well i don't i don't think she can win it this year because she didn't have a, a good year either um similar to, to rachel i mean if if she makes it up on the podium it wouldn't be a total surprise but on the top spot um i don't, you don't, I don't see it happening this year yeah, not this year <laughs> This is why it's great to have you on, you see, because my emotions get the better of me and you've got the statistics and you're going, yeah, I just don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> now, looking a little bit further down the numbers, um, Lucy Gossage, we've had her on the show mm -hmm. here. She's a favorite of ours. Um, we watched the race Ironman UK and she had a domination at Ironman UK. Really, really impressive performance there. What What's your uh, numbers thrown up for her? What's the prediction for her at the moment? Well, I have her uh, somewhere around the, the top 10. Um, for her, it depends a lot on how her training has been and how she's able to uh, to do in Kona because she's never really done that well uh, in Kona. It's not a race dynamic that, that suits her things. Um, last year, she I was... I think she I, suffers I, I, in the heat as well, she said. Yeah, and, and last year, I think she was a little bit injured uh, and couldn't really run too well. Hopefully this year it's better. Um, f for her, I think she'll do best if she just goes into the race without too many expectations um, on what place she's going to turn out, but how she wants her race to unfold. And once she manages to do that, um, if she goes through the day in a, in a decent fashion, I mean, anything 20 and up is possible for her. She could easily finish in the top 10, but probably not, not further up, I think. It depends on what kind of a day she had. Now, we've just seen a, a tweet from her that yesterday she's 
put out a 100-mile time trial on the bike. She rode 348, which has put her as the second <laughs> fastest women's 100-mile wow. time trial on the British lists of all time. So, she, I mean, she can really, really ride. And she can also, she's a really fast runner as well. She's always going to be a couple of minutes down in the swim. Yeah. Um but I'd I'd love to see her put a really great performance yeah, there might, together. There might be interesting race dynamic there because she's got a similar swim ability to uh, someone like an Angela Nath, and Angela Nath yeah. is t is one of those names at least in the U.S. that's uh, pretty highly uh, considered for a good Kona performance. Angela is a touch faster than than Lucy on the bike, but if these two team up. Um, then Lucy might be in a very good position um, starting the run. And that that might just be one of those things where uh, she just tags along with someone, doesn't waste too much energy, mental energy, and figuring out what to do, just goes with, with the way things are. And then all of a sudden finds herself in a decent position on the run. And then once once she's there and once her fighting spirit uh, gets going, um, yeah. that'll, that'll be a good point for her. All to play for. And Susie Cheatham, has she popped up on your radar? Yes. Um, I spoke with her earlier this year uh, a few times. Um, yeah, she's an interesting one because um, she didn't have the, the the stellar results that you would usually have for, for, the, uh, for the Kona crowd. She hasn't won an Ironman before, um, but she did a couple of, of really good races, went into Kona a little bit under the radar, and um, also one of those with a really, really good run. Um, uh, they have a re she and uh, Lucy are going to have a rematch of some of the races that they did together. And I think they know each other quite well. So mm. it will be interesting to see how she does with all the, the Kona hoopla going on there. Big fields, big names and how she deals with yeah, that. She had a great race at the 70.3 Worlds. I think she was sixth or seventh at the 70.3s, but she that was including a, a five-minute penalty. Yeah. She got pinked on the bike for drafting. So without that, it's possible she'd have been up there sniffing around the uh, the podium. So I'd love to see her get up there as well. So interesting times. There's a lot of interesting, great British interest to be had at Kona this year. So are you so, guys uh, considering Leander still a British athlete? <laughs> Yeah, Leander's, yeah, I mean, what do you think? She's been off the radar a little bit this year, hasn't she? Well, I, I don't know who I was speaking to, and we were we were saying, okay, if, if Daniela and Mirinda do not win Kona, who would we pick to win then? And yeah. Leander would be a name that, that comes up there. Um, she had a couple of years where she was dealing with injuries. She seems to be healthy again, and she seems to be going strong again, so... I really don't know what will be possible for her. Uh, top ten could easily be a result. Um, she might I just she don't might know how she is podium, health wise but, um, doing. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. yeah, that's always the big question: is if she's healthy, you can see her finishing on the podium right. or even right. winning. It's just uh, again, I think with Leander, it's one of those situations where because she's got the points from Kona the year before and the previous championship thing, she's kind of under the radar, isn't she, during the year? Yeah, she doesn't have to do much because she's still one of those right. automatic qualifiers with her uh, win. Um, yeah. yeah, could could yeah. could be a surprise. I mean, and question would be her health, as is for Corinne Abraham, who's who's been struggling a bit. So hopefully she'll be fit and ready to go for Kona. Yeah, exciting times. <laughs> Listen, man, we've taken up loads of your time here. Just before we, we tie this up, um, you've got your Kona report coming out, haven't you, later on in this year? Give us a little plug for that. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that I'm working on, and that's why the numbers are just uh, in front of my mind and, and in front of my eyes right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting together a, a report on the Kona Pro Field, uh, with previous results, with the course, uh, with the predictions, a lot of numbers, a lot of discussion of how the race might unfold, a um, bunch of predictions from other people, and uh, that's um, stuff that I'm putting together and hopefully will be done sometime uh, in a week or two from now, so that will be mid uh, to late uh, September in time before the race. Um, yeah, people should just go to tryreading.com. I'll have a Kona post up there that'll point you to where you can download the report. The report uh, will be free and donations accepted. Um, probably turn out to be awesome. in 90 pages or so with a bunch of data. So if, you, if you're interested in the nitty gritty details, um, that's, that's the thing to have when you're following the pro race, I guess. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll be downloading that, man, and sending a few dollars your way. Um, listen, mate, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. Um, you're a really great guy, and the stuff that you've done for the sport here in the background, I think, is making everything much more interesting and accessible for us. So uh, so thank you very much, and I hope we can get you back on the show in the future to oh. talk us through uh, talk us through some more things like this, and we'll see how your predictions play out. Pat. <laughs> I love talking data, so anytime. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Thank you very much Thank for your you. time. I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye now.